Right, second part of the 2015 uh, warm-up video. Uh, let's scroll through where we got to last. We didn't get that far, and we got here. Um, so this is a question on different forms of carbon, diamond and graphite. The first question is, uh, state the term used to describe different forms of the same element in the same physical state. Um, that word is allotrope. Um, and the next question is a, a bit more conventional. Uh, name and describe the type of bonding in diamond. Now, diamond is made up of carbon, um, which is a non-metal, and the bonds there are covalent. Now, that's not enough to score you the three marks. Okay, You need to say a, a huge amount more than that. So, in diamond, each carbon is bonded to four others covalently and the shape around the carbon or each carbon in the structure um, is tetrahedral and that's often worth a mark saying in a tetrahedral shape. It's also worth saying that Diamond is a giant covalent structure. So each carbon is bonded to four others covalently with a tetrahedral shape about the carbon and this forms a giant covalent structure. Now this wonderful, wonderful rigid structure with these strong covalent bonds means that diamond is incredibly hard um, so it's actually used in drill bits um, because it's used at the end because it's so hard it's um, wonderful for um, drilling things. Um, the other allotrope is obviously graphite. Now graphite is, uh, is different. Um, each carbon is covalently bonded to three others. So at the corner of my hexagons are going to be carbons um, and those of you who have seen my drawing before on these videos know how poor it is um, so what we get are layers of hexagons so this is one layer of hexagons here and then underneath it you'll have another layer which doesn't bond to the upper layer Okay, and I'm not going to carry on drawing it, um, but between the layers, this layer, this lower layer, there is a sea of delocalized electrons. So each carbon atom in graphite covalently bonds to three others. And the fact that we've got layers means the layers can slide over each other, and that gives graphite a slippery feel. Now, we've have we done everything the question has asked? Um, hexagonal layer structure, draw a diagram showing three hexagons to show the atoms and bonding in graphite. Well, we've drawn one, two, three hexagons there. We've actually drawn a bonus one and a half below it. Uh, you can see that I've lined up the hexagons so they look the same. Right, so this question is asking why um, do diamond and graphite have such a high temperature where they turn from a solid to a gas, in other words, a high sublimation point. Well, both are giant covalent structures, which means their atoms are connected by strong covalent bonds. And bearing in mind there are millions of atoms in each substance, that means there are going to be millions of covalent bonds that need to be broken. So, you need to refer to this, so uh, millions of strong covalent bonds need to be broken okay therefore a large amount of energy is required to overcome bond. 
bonds. So it's all about breaking those covalent bonds. So this question is all about the halogens and they've arranged the halogens in this table in the same order with which they're in in the periodic table. So fluorine's at the top, acetine at the bottom. And you can see that the melting point of the halogens increases as you go down the periodic table. So fluorine's going to be a gas, chlorine is going to be a gas, bromine is actually a liquid at room temperature, and iodine is a grey solid. Um, now the melting point of acetine is probably, well using this table, probably around about 200, I don't know, 210. Um, I don't know the exact melting point, but with that in mind, uh, acetine is going to be a solid at room temperature, and it will be it will be strongly coloured. Uh, the colour of the elements in group seven becomes darker as you go down the periodic table. And again, we're asked to make a prediction on boiling points. Um, so chlorine is minus 35, and iodine is plus 184. Now, if bromine is a ready brown liquid at room temperature, it means its boiling point has, should be greater than room temperature. And if we look roughly in the middle of those two, we get something round of about 75 degrees Celsius, uh, which is good enough uh, for a mark on this question. Now, it says here, all the elements in group seven have seven electrons in their outer shell. Now, hopefully, um, you already know that. Um, now, when they react, they like to gain electrons. In fact, they don't like to gain electrons. They like to gain an electron to take them to eight electrons in their outer shell. Now, as they're gaining a negative electron, they form a one minus charge. Okay, so they gain one electron. Okay, to complete their outer shell. Okay, and it's one negative because they've gained one negative particle. Now, which of the group seven elements is the most reactive? Now, as we said here, when they react, they gain an electron. So which element do we think in this table gains the electron most easily? And the answer is fluorine. Fluorine is a very, very small atom. Okay, and here are the eight or well, the seven electrons around the fluorine. Okay. Astatine by comparison is much bigger. Now, if we're going to gain an electron, what pulls that electron into that atom? The answer is the positive nucleus at the centre. So the positive nucleus would attract that electron, the positive nucleus would attract that electron. And the closer the outer shell is to that positive nucleus, the more easily that electron is gained. And you can see that astatine's outer shell is further from the nucleus and the outer shell of fluorine is the nucleus. So which element in group 7 is the most reactive? The answer is fluorine. So this question then asks you to work with that um, reactivity series that you should know. So we're, we've got chlorine and we've got potassium bromide. Now if a reaction does occur, the chlorine will displace the bromide from the compound and you'll form potassium chloride which is KCl and bromine will be displaced. Now we should consider actually does that reaction happen? Is chlorine more reactive than bromine? And the answer is yes, chlorine is more reactive than bromine because chlorine is a smaller atom so it's more reactive. So chlorine does have the power to come in and displace the bromide from the compound. Um, 
What's seen during this reaction? Well, you're bubbling chlorine into this substance and you're forming bromine. Now, bearing in mind this is a solution, the bromine is relatively soluble in water and you'll see bromine water forming. And hopefully you remember that bromine water is an orange liquid. Now, in terms of electron transfers, there's nothing asked down here, but you might want to bear in mind that the chlorine here is gaining an electron. The chlorine is changing to chloride. We're gaining, well, we're, we've got two chlorides, and so what's happening is the chlorine is picking up two electrons to form two chlorides. Okay, so chlorine, because it's gaining electrons, that's a reduction. Okay, and the bromide is supplying those two electrons in forming bromine. So bromide is forming bromine and that's an oxidation.